The book, I Like Giving, The Transforming Power of a Generous Life. You get a book called I Like Giving. It's, oh. it's uh, Practical Ideas by Brad Formsma. I've got a good friend who spends his life inspiring generosity. When we started talking about doing a giving show, I thought, we got to have Brad on because he's the, he's the giving guy. It was the most winsome thing I'd ever read, and it wasn't about necessarily giving money. It was about times and thoughts and influence and, and ways that I'd never thought. You know, all I'm doing is sharing these thoughts because guess what these thoughts and stories when they impact our life they affect our heart i've rarely met anyone that's more infectious in terms of the creativity and the joy in giving to others i always say i've never met a angry bitter generous person so <laughs> i want to be generous <laughs> good morning Oh, my. <clears throat> and you've never met a bitter, angry, upset, generous person either, have you? Well, it's an honor to be here. I got to bring a report to you. I get to bring a report. You know, I travel around the country to great churches like yours. And one of the things that the pastor will say is, where are you going next? And so for the last couple months, since Pastor Mike and I set this up, I've been telling him I'm coming to Winston-Salem. And consistently, here's the report. What a humble leader for you guys and for what he does at ORU and other places. So you have to know that's the report that, yeah, thank you for that. <clears throat> I don't hear that often. We'll just let that be there because don't look up where I've been. But that's not always what I hear about descriptions of pastors. So you're in a great place, and uh, it's an honor to be here. Would you say with me, I like giving? All right, now turn to someone around you and say, yes, you do. <laughs> All right, we're going to have some fun this morning talking about the generous life. I hope that I can give you the gift of perspective. Um, I've been studying generosity for nearly a decade and a half, so I've learned so many things. I could talk for weeks, but I'm going to quickly tell you over the next 45 minutes or so, we'll share some thoughts. So we won't run on too long, but there are three things that I've learned over these years that I thought I could give that to you. I think it would give you a fresh perspective on the generous life, and it's something that you could put into practice today and tomorrow, and next week, and on and on. But before we jump into that, I thought I'd take you back. I was maybe four or five years old. My grandpa had a commercial bakery, but he would make these really small loaves of bread. And so one day, uh, I was with him. I brought a picture with you. Uh, there it is. And it uh, looks like a Smucker's commercial, actually, but I never made the cut for that. But, I, you know, this four or five years old, right? Grandpa makes bread and we have this fresh jam and toast. And so that's like four or five years old. And then I turned 11 and he called me one day behind his big bellowing voice. He said, Bradley, I'm going to take you to the bakery. And this time grandpa had a test kitchen that he was bringing me to. And I'm thinking Saturday morning, fresh bread with grandpa and some jam. This is all about Brad bread and time with grandpa. But this well, we got those 16 special loaves in his test kitchen made, and as they cooled off, he loaded them into his trunk, and I started to see the morning changing from what I had planned for that bread. And uh, we went to the first stop, which was a widow from his church. A few loaves of bread came out of the trunk, and he would, he'd squeeze that fresh loaf of bread in her face. Mm. And that's so good. You can just smell it, you know, and it's so good for you. Poor Gramps didn't get the memo on white bread, maybe not being so good for you. Sorry, Gramps. Uh, but the idea was is that he would then be there and he would give an affirming word. He would be kind to her. He would give her affirmations. And so he was modeling generosity of words. Well, the next stop brought us to someone who had a financial need, and this time a few more loaves of bread came out and a white envelope with a check in it. And he explained to me he was being generous with his money. 
then I'm kind of thinking, this is a good time to pull the car over so I can have some bread. But no, that wasn't the plan. Now the third stop was a few more loaves of bread, and this time a letter of recommendation. You see, he was showing me generosity of influence. And as the morning went on, generosity of time, he modeled, generosity of attention, generosity of the way that we share our stuff. And so that was the beginning part of me being able to see the generous life, including money, but beyond money. So let me just take you through those seven ways. In fact, I put them in a, a little bulletin kind of insert because this is a way for you to reference in the coming weeks a guide. There's probably hundreds of ways someone could be generous, but these seven will let you aim at it. Interesting, there's one for each day, if you will. But I think every day we have an opportunity to be generous in these different ways. So let me take you through them. The first one, generosity of thoughts. Boy, this is an interesting one. You know, God says, love your neighbor as yourself. And I got to tell you, sometimes the way I think, I feel bad for my neighbor. You know, and th then there's ways that we could be generous with our thoughts towards others. It's powerful because our minds can be overrun with wrong thinking. So what if we think about what we think about when we think generosity? And what are our thoughts? Are we connected with them? Let's be generous with our thoughts. The second way is generosity of words. We can build people up with our words or we can tear people down. God's word says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. So how are we using our words? Generosity of money. This one is so huge because it, every time I give, it softens my heart. I become more like God. It releases the grip of money on my life. And I see it as a tool and it's less of an idol. It's a powerful way to be generous. And then generosity of influence. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be where I am today if somebody didn't at somewhere help connect me or someone didn't use their influence, even if it was just in a, in a home or at work or Sunday school or what, whatever it would be, we can look at the influence that we have in our lives and we can be generous and help people. There's, there's nothing like being able to connect somebody to help them get to where they need to go. And we have the Holy Spirit who is the ultimate guide on these things. And then generosity of time, the way we can volunteer, the way we can help here and in our community. Generosity of attention. This one, I said to my wife the other day, I wish I just had six ways of living generously. This one's just too hard. I don't know why I included it. Well, I do, because the Lord wants me to keep working in this area. So I don't know if you've ever had this where you're at a, like a, a gathering and you're talking to someone, but you're looking over their shoulder thinking, I got to catch up with that person. And the person that you're talking to can feel that you're about 84% with them. Have you... Nobody else has done this? Okay. Anyway, the idea of being 100% there, and I could feel that person going, can you just be all with me? And I could see myself splitting off and not being all with them. And then that night, I was out for my uh, date with my wife, and I looked around the restaurant, and I saw all these people that went out to dinner with their cell phones. And I, and I went into judgment mode, how, like how crazy, until I realized I was on mine. What is going on? What is it like to be fully present with someone? Okay, I, you know, this six ounce piece of glass, plastic, and technology that I carry around in my pocket, but it's often here, right, right here, it is the ultimate anti attention generosity device. I don't get this right every time, but at least I'm becoming more aware of how hard that is to be generous with my attention. Look, can you think about a time when you know that somebody gave you 100% of their attention and how that made you feel? 
We all can remember it, and it's sticky. At one time, I ended up at Southwest Airlines. I was flying on one of their planes. I regularly fly with them. And I felt like the Lord was saying to me, go meet with their founder. I'm like, yeah, right. How am I going to get in with him? But you know when God's up to a plan, he'll get you through whatever door. It's pretty fun to follow that adventure. So I ended up in the office of uh, Herb, who founded the airline. And he's smoking a cigarette, and there's another one in the ashtray, which I was still trying to put that one together. But he just wanted to be ready for the next puff or whatever. Anyway, he jumped up. He's six foot five, taller than me. He comes over, gives me this huge hug, and I can hear the cigarette crackling over my shoulder, but I'm excited because the founder of Southwest is hugging me, but I don't know where the ashes are going. Anyway, he then locks on to me, and he says, where are you from? And we had this close conversation, and he was I told him Michigan, and he said, you ever hear about those people with Northwest Airlines? And he's sucking, he said, they thought they could compete with old Herb. He said, they bought all these airplanes. They forgot it's about the people. And I was like, man, I love this guy. I mean, I love people. He likes people. But I'll never forget him being fully attentive. Here he is, 60, 50, 60,000 employees. And for that moment of time we were together, we were all he was all there. And I think that's a powerful thing that we can all become more aware of being full in our attention. And then sharing our stuff, generosity of sharing our possessions, our stuff. This one is such a simple yet complex way. I'll give you an example. Your neighbor knocks on the door and says, um, hey, I'm making chocolate chip cookies. I'm short a couple eggs. Can I have, you know, can I help finish that? Oh, yeah, you kind of skip to the refrigerator, don't you? And you get them a few eggs. You might even be thinking you're going to get a cookie out of the deal. And then a week later, they knock again and they say, hey, I noticed that you got a new car and you're selling your other one or mine's got to be in the shop for a week. Could I use your car? And a, and a hush fell over the crowd. Why is the, it's so funny, these different areas of what we think is appropriate to share and what isn't? I don't know what that is for you, but I would submit that perhaps you could ask the Lord, hey, what, what would you want me to do to get stretched in that area uh, if you believe like me that it's all his? So would you join me in an opening prayer? Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a beautiful day in your creation. Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak to each of us individually about which of these seven areas you would have us grow in, that you would have us become more aware in our own life of how we could step into action and do them. We we want to be uh, used by you in our world. And through these seven ways, we know that we can make a difference and glorify you in this world. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So then then I ended up uh, going into business myself, not with grandpa, uh, right out of college, for almost 20 years. In 2005, I was on a run. I was reading a book about the Holy Spirit And I was really crying out like, Lord, show me what you want me to do. Everything in my life was going right, kind of in the natural, as we might say. But there was something missing. And so I'm just, you know, what is it? And I'm on this run, and I hear, Brad, I'm going to use you to encourage people in their giving. Bring greater hope and joy to people's lives. You'll influence influential people with this message, which is my message. It's my message that it's more blessed to give than receive. And I thought, what in the world do you do with that? I I don't know. I didn't even leave town for spring vacation. So I went home and journaled it. And within about a year, I had sold this small business and I started an organization called I Like Giving. The whole idea was to inspire people to live generously by taking scriptural principles and stories and putting them together and And so that's what I started to do. And that's what brought me on this journey of finding so many different aspects of the generous life. And so the three things that I want to share with you that I learned today, the first one is awareness. 
And it's this whole idea about getting our antenna working to be looking and listening and observing opportunities. I mean, I haven't been here very long, but I, I even heard one in the announcements, right? Camp. What an, there's a giving opportunity right in front of us to help someone have an experience. Our good friend Mark Batterson says, when you have a change of place and a change of pace, you get a change of perspective. And I think that at, when you go to camp, that happens. And so that's an opportunity, just, just saying, for you to pick up on your antenna. Now, my sons, they're... Um, always telling me that I'm getting older, and they said, Dad, you really need to explain uh, what an antenna is. There's people under 30 in the audience. So an antenna is you hit the button, and the antenna goes up, and the whole idea is it's supposed to pick up some kind of signal. So for there you go. I did it. Uh, but anyway, th that will maybe help you as you are looking and listening for opportunities. So the first word, awareness, I want to bring you to a passage in Galatians. Galatians 6, Paul says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. You see, we get to give. As I've studied this passage, I've also found that the word opportunity comes in different translations, privilege. What is that shift for you when you think about giving as a privilege, as something we get to do? Perhaps there have been times that you've given under duty or obligation, and yet when I start to look at something that it's a privilege to be invited to, it's exciting, it's fun. For our family, we have really tried to get our antenna working over the years, and I was reading a newspaper article. Uh, at the time, we had a 10, 7, and 2-year-old, and so I read this newspaper article about a Sudanese father and son that had uh, basically been firebombed out of their village. They lost friends, they lost family, and they ended up in Michigan, this small church, and as I read the article further, they had clothes on their back and a couple bikes. Now, one of the bikes was how dad got to work, and the other bike was the son's toy. As I read further, I realized that their bikes had been stolen, and I'm like, that's crazy. So I said to my kids, like, what should we do? And my oldest son's like, we got to go get them bikes. And I'm like, you're right, we got to go get them bikes. So we jump in the minivan, go to the bike store, load them in the back. And uh, this is probably a good time for me to explain that I married somebody opposite. I don't know if you guys have done that or gals. But uh, I'm the ready, fire, aim, activator guy, and my wife's the planner. So her idea of a surprise birthday party is, you know, probably two weeks of planning and details. All that to say is we pulled up to the first traffic light with three kids and two bikes in the back of the car. She looks over and says... Where do they live? Good question. They don't put the address in the newspaper. I don't know where they live. So we went on a four-hour wild goose chase all over our city. And when we found them, because of the language barrier, all the dad could say is, I like bike, I like bike. He's just driving his bike down the street. Well, we got in the car and we headed off. And she looks over at me and she says, you know what? I think God had an assignment for us today. We had our antenna working like your grandpa modeled us. And then from the back of the car, one of my kids goes, that was so much better than going to the water park, which was what the plan was that day until we had the car full of bikes, couldn't find it. I believe one of the reasons I'm giving my life away to this message is that the youngest generation can experience the joy of giving early because here's how God created us. When we give, we experience the joy. There's all these things that happen in us of connection. We feel better. But you know what? God's so good and so big, 
the person receiving experiences these feelings biologically and the person observing feels them. He just, it's, we were wired for this. It's baked inside of us, but when our research over and over shows when kids have this model to them and experience it when they're younger, they do it the rest of their life. I'll bet if I sat with you and maybe we'll say hi at the book table or something in back, how many times people say, oh, but my grandma, oh, my grandpa. I just had it at the last service. We had this huge line, all these people saying, you know what? I'm so glad you brought that up because so-and-so, they taught me how to be generous. I saw them do it, right? I mean, this is rich. Now, that wasn't on the script, so, you know, who knows where I am right now. But we're just going to take a deep breath, and I'm going to tell you that I'm talking about awareness. <laughs> we got done talking about Paul. Oh, yeah, so my friend, hey, we were having dinner last night at this Mexican place, and pastor prays that I'd be anointed and be led by the Spirit to, to say what I'm supposed to say. So apparently that little mo- emotional session that you just had there, that was the Lord. I'm not in control. So we're just bringing that to you. We're all in this together. So I said to my buddy Scott, like, the I like bike story, and he says, well, I, I'm at my dentist's office, and I hear this single parent say, $926, I can't pay it. And he said, you know me, like, I'm introverted. I, I don't even know if I like people. But he said, I kept hearing, I like bike, I like bike in my head. So he jumps up and he goes and gives the the credit card to the lady, the cashier, and just says, I'll take care of it. When I'm with Dave Ramsey, I say debit card. He likes that a little better. But anyway, (laughs) my friend Scott said, tears are flowing down this lady's face. And he said, at that moment, I realized like, This was another expression for me to live generously during the week outside of the regular giving that I do at our church and other ministries. And he said, I started out giving 100 here and 200 there. And over years, my giving kind of expanded. And he said, this is yet another way for me to express my love for God and my heart for other people. And so, like I mentioned earlier, I get to travel to places, that's the exciting part. The less attractive thing is airport bathrooms, then they're often not clean. So if you find a clean one, it's a bonus. Any of you that travel know this. And uh, I was at this airport and I was walking out and you ever have like, you just know the Holy Spirit's nudging you to do something or say something. And I'm supposed to be the giving guy, but I totally deny it because the guy who had cleaned that bathroom made it so nice, was standing right there. I like denied it. I got 15 steps away. But he's gentle, isn't he? He says, I just gave you an idea. Why don't you head on back? So turn around, head back. Sir, I just want to thank you for making this airport bathroom so nice and clean. And I reached out my hand and I said, I'm Brad. And he buried his hand in mine. And he said, I'm Conrad. And I noticed that the patch on his shirt was empty. And I said, Conrad. If you work for me, your name would be on your shirt. I think you're a good man. And I could just see this tear well up in his eye. And I float away from him and catch up with my wife. And she's like, what happened? You're glowing. And I'm like, I just went to the bathroom. No, I just... No, I said, I just met Conrad. She's like, who's Conrad? And I'm like, let me just sit in this a minute. You know, if you, you've experienced this. You guys are givers. You give and you think, oh, well, and then you end up receiving so much more. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, Jesus is so true, so right. It's more blessed to give than receive. But there was not money exchanged there. There was the generosity of words. And I believe that daily, weekly, monthly, we have these opportunities to live this out in our lives. So awareness, we, gotta get our, we get to get our antenna working. Second thing I wanna share with you is action. It's one thing to be inspired, and that's good. I think that's a motivator for us. But we 
get to act. And so this passage in Proverbs, one of my favorites, says a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And I love the refreshes word because it says it's not refresh or refreshed. It's refreshes. It's continual. It's daily, weekly, monthly, I, I often say. I uh, have three benefits. There's probably three million, but I put three for the bulletin today. And the first one is the, the benefit is that when you give, you send it ahead. I have a 104-year-old friend who's generous. I told him, I said, Stanley, the problem is is that you live a lot longer when you're generous. So, you know, you might be here a while. But here's the thing. Stanley would always say, well, I just put it in the bank account of heaven. So matter-of-factly, he'd say, I just put it in the bank account of heaven. It was like, that's really interesting thinking. He said, you know, when I, when I give it there, he, gave, he decided that, I'm going to give half of the income I make from my business when it was really small. And then the business grew. Shocker. And he just said, I just put it in the bank account of heaven. He said, you know what? Whenever I give to my church, whenever I give to other ministries and um, other people, I no longer have to manage it. I don't have to think about it. It's just sent ahead. And so there's a benefit there. You get the eternal Benefit of the reward being in heaven and you get the joy of giving while you're on earth. Second thing is there are health benefits when you're being generous. My friend Stephen Post wrote a book, Why Good Things Happen to Good People. And he says, when you do three different acts of generosity like we described uh, earlier each week, you live ten, uh, 10 years longer you take half the medicine. We find studies showing that depression drops off the map when we get focused onto someone else. And this is a powerful thing because now we know money is a way of being generous and, and a very important way, but it's not the only way. So those are the, uh, the second, the third benefit is generosity benefits relationship. I mean, think about this. Have you, have you ever said, oh, I, I, want, I want you to meet Stingy Sally. She's awesome. And you guys should go out to lunch sometime. And when you're with her, uh, it's going to be interesting in looking at the menu because she's going to kind of guide you to the lower cost thing just in case she actually ends up being stuck with the bill. But even when the bill comes, you know, that's kind of funny. They just kind of look at it and then look away. And what do we do? And it gets awkward. Nobody says, I want you to meet that person in my life. But people do say... Oh, you, they are so, you got to meet them. They're so generous. They just are always doing for other people, right? We always want to share our relationships that are generous, that are good. And it ties out with the scripture, right? The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The world of the generous get larger and larger. So just three benefits real quick on that whole uh, action step. Uh, for, for our family, we made the, decision early on in our lives to want to be generous with our family. And uh, this is one of my most uncomfortable stories, but we had a moment about three years ago where uh, my wife thought I was giving to our church, and we like to give to God first, and I thought that she was giving to the church. Do y'all know what happens when that, that's going on? No giving to church. Oops, I'm supposed to be the giving guy. So we kind of had to get that straight after several months had gone past us. So we ended up doing the online deal, or I saw you have the text to give. But these are ways to regularly give to avoid that story. Because I know y'all want to give and, and do give, but there's thing, things like life and travel and, you know, that kind of stuff. So to avoid that story might be a thought for you. Um, I would just say that we found so much joy of being able to regularly give to our church, and we love what God's doing there in Southern California. You see, um, we also talk to our kids about having an emergency giving fund. 
And this was after we gave to church and after we did some other things that we felt drawn to. We would have a, a, some lifestyle spending decisions that would allow us to start an emergency giving fund. And we told our kids, like, get your antennas working, bring ideas to us. You know, we can't solve every situation, but it's a chance to discuss it and pray through it and become aware. And so one day my son came to me and he said, my buddy just found out that his dad has two months to live. And is there anything we can do? And we decided the prepaid visa card is going to be perfect. They've got to have a medical expense that we wouldn't know about. And and that might help them. And so we sent it off to them, never expecting anything to, to come from it other than for them to receive the gift. And sure enough, that doctor was right. And a couple months uh, went by and, and that young man's dad passed away. Three weeks after he passed away, we got a note in the mail. And it said, Dear Brad and Laura, my husband was pacing back and forth in the living room, asking God to provide money to put new tires on my car so that I would be safe during the winter before he went to heaven. The creator of the universe works through us to be a part of answering prayer. The creator of the universe, he invites us to be a part of answering someone else's prayer. I would submit that we have to have, yeah, absolutely. He trusts us. He trusts us. It's a, that's a privilege. And I, I tell people all the time, you know, when I'm asked, I mean, I run a small ministry. When I'm asked, what do you need? I know that that takes faith on behalf of the giver, because then I'm going to give them an answer, hopefully clear, and then they get to go to the creator of the universe and find out what he would have them do. I pray all the time for my friends that are pastors that people would come to them and say, what do you need? And it doesn't mean that the person who asked the question is necessarily going to solve it, but it is such a powerful thing to be able to take that step and trust that you can begin a conversation to learn. How would we always know? There's so many different ministry elements here at your church. What happens if you ask that of someone? Perhaps God would have you ask that question to someone today. It's so, so significant. Yeah. And then the the third thing that I want to share with you is that... um, I uh, got, got called to a doctor's office and they said to me, um, you know, you have some issues with your blood. We want to do some more tests. And sitting in the oncology office and the, the doctor uh, explains to me that I have a rare form of blood cancer called leukemia. And in in a split moment, my whole life flashed before my eyes. Um, and I would suspect that you've had your life flash before your eyes, or if you haven't, you will. And in that moment, for me, I was able to go to my hope, my hope in Jesus as my Savior, and I, want, I would want that for any of you. And so if you want to meet Jesus, he wants to meet you. And there are people here at the church that, We'll pray with you, and I'm happy to chat with you afterwards. But in those moments, you also start to see the, like, real life. I, I have a young daughter. Who's going to walk her down the aisle? Who, who's going to take care of this young family? And it's kind of scary. And yet I found myself going back to that other family's story and the need that they had that the man was praying. And I thought, I would have chickened out had we not made that pre-decision to be generous. And yet, I was able to take the focus off of Brad and put it on to someone else by God's grace. And I think this is, there's something powerful that we all 
yeah, the, like, this isn't about a perfect giver. I miss all the time. But there's a powerful thing when we get in step with God's way of seeing and thinking about others. And I don't know, I mean, I've, this guy, I can't wait to meet him in heaven. Like, I like tires, right? Is that what I, we're gonna high five on? I don't know. But think about this guy pacing back and forth in his living room. And if I was too scared or I don't know what's gonna happen or is God really gonna provide, can I really trust him to meet my needs? And I think there's, there's really something there. So then you get to bring these seven ways with you to the doctor's office. Many of you go to doctor's offices and other places. So for me at Southern California, I drive up to UCLA, Ronald Reagan Medical Center. And when you go there, they take all of this blood and money from you. <clears throat> and the, the, lady, <clears throat> the lady doing it this one day, her name tag says Joy, and she's not having a good day, and she's just, you can just tell, she's off. And uh, don't you love it? Some people just have the wrong name for the job. Can we say that, right? <clears throat> My sons come in the other day and they're like, hey, but some people have the right name for the job. I'm like, what are you talking about? Oh, no, no, we researched it on Google. What would we do without Google? And uh, they said, well, the guy that invented the toilet, his name was Thomas Crapper. Fitz. <laughs> so anyway, I uh, hope that works for you. But the, the, you know what I'm saying? Some people have the right name for the job. Anyway, I, with Joy, I... I said to her, like, Joy, do you ever go with a friend and just get one of those big 960 calorie Starbucks drinks with all the whipped cream and the drizzle and all that? And she looks at me kind of funny and she's like, well, I think I would. And so as she's, you know, trying to like get through her ugly day, uh, she's labeling up all this blood they took from me. And I slid one of those Starbucks gift cards on her chair. And then as I got to the door frame, I said, hey, Joy, have fun with your friend. And it was like, boom, in a moment. She smiled, we smiled, my attitude, which I th I'm thinking she's not noticing, I'm pouting, right? Have you ever had that where you think, no one notices that I'm off and I'm having a bad day? It's the funniest thing about ourselves, we deceive ourselves. I'm like, she knew I was having a bad day. But in that brief moment, everything changed. The back of my business card, I put giving changes everything because this, to me, was the fastest moment for me to ship, shift attention off of me and onto someone else. And I cracked a smile on her and we made a day. And the thing is, I don't always get it right and sometimes it doesn't land how you want it to because it was like a, maybe a month later, I was back up there, different nurse, different situation, and I didn't quite talk to her about what I wanted to do for her right in that moment. So she got away from me a little bit down the hallway. So I was like, oh, uh, ma'am, nurse, you know. Uh, and so she's walking back towards me. And you ever have those conversations that start bad and just get worse because you keep talking? That was me. So I've got the gift card stuck in my pocket between the keys in my pocket. And I said, has anybody ever? And she walks up. She's like this tall. So she's looking up at me. I'm looking down at her. Have you ever had anybody ask you if you want to go have one of those big Starbucks drinks with a friend? And she's like, oh, my word. I thought you were going to ask me out on a date. I saw your wedding ring. I'm like, this is creepy. <laughs> and she... She grabbed the gift card and ran down the hallway. So it didn't, oh, it didn't work, okay? But uh, we're better when we give. We're better when we give. When we move from awareness to action, it takes me to the third point. Impact. We never know how one gift is gonna make an impact in our life and in the world around us. I bring you to this passage in Matthew where Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. One of my favorite ways to clarify a giving opportunity is to just ask a question. I, I had been reading about widows and orphans in Galatians and I thought, where do I find a widow? You know, my grandparents are passed away and a light bulb went off, like, what if I ask the person that cuts my hair? Maybe she cuts the hair of a widow. So 
you know how you're there and they're like shampoo and you're, you're kind of tipped upside down and you get a little bit disoriented. And I sat up in the chair and I'm, I said, where do I get a widow? It came out a little funny. And she says, what, what do you, and I explained to her, well, I've been reading about widows and how I want to help them. They're close to the heart of God. And she said, I got the perfect lady. Her name's Evelyn. She's in her 90s. Her husband's passed away. She's run out of money, getting ready to cut back on medicine. And so our family started just sending her money anonymously for a couple years. And we honestly thought, we'll just see her in heaven. But then she turned like 96. And we're like, maybe we should meet this lady who's cashing the checks. So (laughs) we go out for lunch with her. And you, instant friendship. But you know why? Because where your treasure is, your heart is. And so we already had all this connection for us. And this, she stands like this tall, flowing silver hair. She's just, she's got the giver's glow, I call it. You could just tell, she just, everywhere she goes. And so about that time, the work of I Like Giving was really growing and we were becoming known online for our short films. We create these short videos, three to six minutes long on the generous life with stories and scriptural principles woven together. And so when this happens, then you start to have a publisher want to try to track you down to write a book. And so they came to me and um, they said, you should write a book. And I said, I'm not your guy. I cheated in high school English. And they said, we can help people like you, which is a little scary about other authors out there, but you know, hey. What I know is they caught a vision to get these stories. Some of these stories are from you guys. They come in from all around the world. Some of them is me just being a guide through the book. But I want to read you a couple sentences from Evelyn's story because we captured that before um, the book was done. She says, tears ran down my cheeks and I felt deeply grateful And at that moment, I knew what I needed to do. You see, money is like a river. It's meant to keep on moving. Can I give this to you, sir? I could throw it, but I don't know if you should throw books at church or not. I don't know how that works, you know? I guess I might not be here next weekend, so... (laughs) Yeah, you're welcome. (laughs) Oh, man. Evelyn's wisdom... Money is like a river. It's meant to keep on moving. We found out from her daughter that some of the money we were giving her each month, she was giving to other people. And I think that's a picture for all of us. You see, it's not about how much you have and then you should start giving. It's wherever you are, you can start giving today. Yeah, that's right. So, Evelyn, oh my word, I want to introduce you to her. So we have a couple minute video from her life. If you turn your attention to the screens and I'll be right back. How old are you? 97. I'll be 98 in October. (laughs) I live in a retirement community. And we used to have a bus here to take people to the grocery store twice a week. And they gave that bus up, I don't know why. So a lot of people were stuck around here. Like my neighbor Joyce, who was a very shy person. She said to me, well, if they don't get another bus, they'll find another place for me to live. And she says, I just don't wanna go anywhere else. I said, Joyce, I'll get you to the grocery store every week. But I lost my driver's license because somebody thought I was too old. But I didn't have a mark against me at all. I was heartbroken at that. I really was. It made me feel old. It made me feel useless.
I am a good driver. I really am. I, I'm not fearful when I drive, but I'm very careful. You're a hot rodder? No. Drag well, I drive 65, but I obey the rules, so I went to get it back. <laughs> oh, don't you love her? Oh. Okay, now, don't throw anything at me. The rest of the story, I like giving.com. It's in the back of this bulletin insert. The reason why we stop the story halfway is we know the power and the fun that comes from being able to talk about generosity together. So we'd encourage you as a family, in business, life group, whatever, take four and a half minutes, look this story up, it's right here, and there, we have two follow-up questions to just start a dialogue. And one of them is, who first meddled, modeled generosity to you? This isn't like a big prescriptive thing. You're gonna learn things about each other. You're probably gonna learn things about your kids and your grandkids that you never knew. And you know what? When you, you're either gonna share your story or bury your story. So let's share it, okay? So Evelyn went to heaven a couple years ago and man, that was a tough phone call for me to get. I mean, I know she's in a better place but, and we even had moved to California, but it was like we would talk on the phone and that treasure heart connection, it's so powerful. I went to her funeral and it was packed. You couldn't find a room. And little, little news flash, when you die at 98, they're not all your friends that are 98 that are there because they passed away earlier. I actually took a picture in the narthex or back area of the church because you would see 20, 30, 40 year olds, 50 year olds, 60, all the way up. And it was a powerful picture. I have a friend actually who is in the funeral business and he says he can tell right away at a person's funeral whether they were a giver or a taker. I'm like, wow, Chet, that's pretty scary. Here's what's exciting though. We're all live. We can decide here on forward how, what kind of funeral we want to have. Anyway, talk about being off script. We just did it again, didn't we? Okay, so speaking of impact, I have my 17-year-old son who's going on 27, so it makes for an interesting parenting challenge with me. And I was going to ask him to, you know, share. Um, I can't have him have his driver's license out at the book table. We had a lot of people questioning that after he shared today. So he is 17, and uh, he drives like one, too. So, Drew, will you come on up and share a few thoughts? Will you welcome Drew Formsma? Only on Father's Day can do that. <laughs> oh, it's good to be here today. Today I wanted to just share my perspective on generosity and inspire if it's parents, grandparents, and even any kids my age that we can do this and we can step into this and we can make this part of our lifestyle. I wanted to take you back to a story. I was on the back of the bus headed to golf practice one day and I was on the back of the bus and my friends started to make fun of this kid that had a disability. And I sat there and didn't say anything. And I got off the bus that day and I kind of watched it disappear in the distance and I felt like I missed an opportunity. And I feel like I could have stepped in and said something to him. But then fast forward two months, I was sitting in my first day of high school and I was sitting there and all these thoughts are going through my head. Am I gonna make friends? Are there any cute girls? Yeah, there's some cute ones here. <laughs> uh, come on. And I'm thinking all these thoughts, and she's, whoo. <laughs> We're awake. Yes. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, and I had that impression where I felt like God told me, hey, Look for someone like the kid you didn't stick up for. See if you can find someone in high school where you can shift the perspective off of Drew and onto the people around me. So I'm like, okay, God, I got it. Give me an opportunity. And so I start looking around, and this kid right next to me, 
about this tall, thick glasses. I'm like, there he is, whoa. So I walk over to him. I'm like, hey, I'm Drew. And he's like, hey, I'm Tim. And then it got awkward. I'm like, no, I hate awkward circumstances. And when I'm in one, I tell a joke. So I'm like, hey, Tim, why did the golfer have two pairs of pants? He's like, dude, I have no idea. I said, because he had a hole in one. And <laughs> weeks after weeks, I obviously told funnier jokes. And a friendship started to happen. I would see him in the hallways. <laughs> hey, Tim, have a great day. I would just sit with him at lunch, help him do his homework, just be his friend. And then I realized about six months in, I realized this was kind of affecting my friends because they wanted to be part of this as well. One day, I looked down the hallway, and Tim is coming down the hallway, and my friend's coming from the other direction, and my friend put out his hand toward Tim and told him, I hope you have a great day. I realized my friends wanted to be a part of this. They just needed someone to lead them. And how many, I mean, that didn't, that didn't take me a lot of money. That took me no money, but I was able to be generous with my influence, and I was able to be generous with my time, all things that everybody in this room can do. We all can do this. And I understand that, like, money for me, I'm not, I'm not loaded. But I do, I am able to step into these opportunities throughout my everyday life. And how many times have I been in that same spot as Tim, feeling less than, not feeling known? And I believe we all have someone in this room like that we can step into. If it's somebody we work with, if it's somebody we go to school with, if it's somebody we don't like, I think we all can do it. And I, I have parents and grandparents often come up to me after speaking, and they're like, Drew, okay, you got to give me a game plan. I'm going to go back and try to teach this to my kids. Give me something. So I'm like, okay. So I came up with an acronym, ME, M-E-E. -E. I even put it in your bulletin. I know. Model, encourage, engage. Let's take it back. Model. When we model generosity to the people around us, to our kids, to our grandkids, they'll follow. My dad followed in his grandpa's footsteps. I have followed in what my parents have modeled to me. And I believe that putting it into action and doing it yourself is what's going to move them into action. That story of the bikes, I was right there in the back seat, Cheerios flying everywhere, and I can still remember that moment. Same thing with Tom and the gift card. And I would just challenge you to do it. Just go do it. Just go make this part of your lifestyle and your kids will see it. Then encourage. Encourage your kids to give. But don't force it. Don't go there. That's gross. Show them where to give and why. Why you give. Just give them opportunities to step into. Then lastly, en engage. Engage in this conversation. Share your stories around the dinner table. I... I really believe that when we start talking about generosity, it's what motivates people into action. The stories you've heard today are gonna move you to act sometime this week, next week, next month. So share your stories with your kids. Because I have kids at school come up to me and they're like, hey Drew, I don't know what generosity means. And I'm like, woo, this is not good. I got work to do. So share your stories and bring this conversation in and maybe even show Evelyn around the table. It'd be very powerful. We, we've had people buy boxes of books for their school or for their church environment or for their life group because they know this message works for everyone. If, you're, if we're eight or 98, we all can play in this game. And we know that the world becomes a better place when we give, but we get to step into this. We get this as a privilege, and the joy we get from giving is unbelievable, and I want it for everyone in this room, and we're just two guys who are excited about giving, and we're excited for you as you go in your journey and become stretched in giving. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Drew. Yeah, you can meet Drew out and back. He's been known to sign my book, so it's kind of a funny thing because he's like, hey, I like this. I didn't write your book, and I get to sign it, and uh, that's where he'll be. But when we start with awareness and move to action, our antenna's working, and then we trust God for the impact, we never know how far the generosity ripple will go. 
I asked one question to a hairdresser that led me to Evelyn, but now Evelyn's story has been viewed over 10 million times online. And I think that we all have, we all have the opportunity to step in. There, this church, the giving, the faithful giving that you do here, the ripple throughout your community is still happening. And I just say, well done, keep, keep at it, keep going. And I hope today these seven ways is more of a refreshing and an encouraging way for you to step in. And we have our website, we have it on there because we know that generosity inspires generosity. So there's content there for you to continue to be refreshed so you can refresh others. So it's been a privilege to be here today I, with I'd love to say hi to you out and back. We, we just spent more time meeting part of your church family in the last service, and it's just fun. So many of you have stories and prayer. By the way, I didn't mention that I'm still in the health battle, and I take regular chemotherapy, but I believe that God will, will heal me and that he will, um, yeah. <clears throat> so... Thank you. Amen. And uh, somebody went to the cafe and wanted to be generous and send you some apple juice. I like apple juice. So there you go. Thank you, Brad. Would you like to thank Brad and Drew for sharing their story today? Incredible. Such an important message on Father's Day. Do you agree? Did you like that? A couple of things. For me, this is a, a, a very prophetic moment. I met uh, Brad four years ago or so at Oral Roberts University, and uh, he, he travels and, and ministers to uh, the rich and famous and uh, to uh, anyone who will receive the message. But I knew when I met him that there would be a moment when, when we would call for that message to be birthed in our congregation this is a prophetic word for us. That's the kind of church we are. It's what we aspire to be. You know, you could be a, the wealthiest church in the city, and you could even give the most money to needs in the city, but not be generous. I want us at the top of the list when, um, when Jesus and the Holy Spirit are looking at our church, I want in their heart and on their face to be a smile to say, you know what? Winston-Salem First is the most generous church there is in Winston-Salem City proper, and I'm, I'm honored and thrilled, and that's my heart. Well, today, uh, I ask, actually, I ask permission uh, from Brad um, and to make the commercial for the books. The two books, the, the hardback out there, uh, Drew and his father wrote that one together. That's a great one, but this paperback that's... Uh, gone around the world and is so powerful, which was my first introduction to them, has little stories. And we've been helping you think about your growth this summer and how to grow as a family or whatever. And you could just read a, a chapter, um, you know, after dinner and just kind of discuss it, just little chats, chats about the story. It would help your family engage with the idea of giving if you're, if you're a single. But today what we're doing is to say, hey, why don't you buy two of them and give one of them away? It's two for $25. So you can get that out there. And you know me, I don't, uh, I don't make commercials and hawk books from the front unless I know that it's going to add to your spiritual growth. And uh, so that's good. So Wednesday night, I'm going to be sharing about um, <clears throat> how to use God's weapon, uh, uh, how to use God's mercy as a weapon uh, against the spiritual pollution in your life and against psychic disturbances. And so if you're interested, I've already prepared the handout for Wednesday night. You can come and receive that. I'll be uh, sharing on Wednesday night. It should be a great time together. Claire and Clint are going to come, and we've got the final results on uh, the drawing for all the prizes. Uh, what, a, what a great, great day. Glad that you were here. Happy Father's Day to all of you, and be sure and stop by the book table. Wow. Thank you, Pastor. What a terrific day. Amen. Once again, we celebrate and honor all of you fathers today. We'll make this brief. Um, as I promised, uh, our on-duty uh, officer that is in uniform, he's the one that did all the drawings, so it is legit. So here's, here's how this works. Our first drawing was for a family four-pack to the home opener of 
Wake Forest football season. That is on August the 30th. That's a Friday night. And the winner uh, of this drawing is Wayne Everhart. Wayne Everhart. So you can Ooh, pick. Congratulations. You can pick these up in Central Foyer right there. I'll be there to greet you. So they're meeting you. Ooh, yes. This microphone is hot. Me. They're meeting you. Yes. At maybe Central the column Foyer. Central Foyer. Right where you signed up. All right. So look for the shirt that looks like an Easter egg. <laughs> Actually, I picked out his outfit. I don't this know if that's a so. compliment or. It's a total compliment. A shade. Okay. Yeah, it's a total compliment. All right. All right. So the Thunderbirds hockey tickets, two tickets. Jeffrey Dealey. Jeffrey Dealey, see Clint in the Central Foyer. All right. Soon as service is over. All right. We have two tickets to the Wake Forest basketball game. How many, if your name is Ben, raise your hand. Ben. Because I didn't get a last name, it's just Ben. So if your number, if your cell number is uh, 655-5355, I just gave away your cell number, Ben, to everybody in the world. <laughs> I just realized that. But you don't know who that Ben is, so we'll incognito meet together in the foyer. So it's not a, a Ben. Oh, you don't care, do you? All right. Right there. Yay. Congratulations. Hey, meet my new friend, Ben. <laughs> All right, what you got? All right, and so the family four-pack to the Dash baseball game, mm -hmm. four Chick-fil-A vouchers, and four Dash baseball hats for Saturday, August 17th is Tim Hutchins. Tim Congratulations, Hutchins. Congratulations, Tim. All right, let's give all of our fathers right. a round of applause yes, yes. and celebrate them and what God is doing in their lives and their families. Hey, as you go... There's some more biscuits out there. Take one for today. Take one for tomorrow. You can heat it up for breakfast Take one in the for morning. All week. Take one for your family. We got plenty to go around. Hey, God bless you. Have a great Father's Day. We love you.